Robert Langer has been described by his American colleagues as the Michael Jordan of engineering. Canadians refer to him as the Wayne Gretzky of biotech. Call him what you may, such superlative compliments for the remarkable talented chemical engineering, Professor Robert Langer, are hardly exaggerated metaphors. In fact, as the single most cited engineer in history, and as the person widely credited with founding the fields of controlled release drug delivery and tissue engineering, those sporting tributes are not really adequate to describe Professor Langer's impact as one of the greatest scientists of our time. However, since we are comparing him with a few of the world's better known athlete superstars, let me continue the game by sharing with you some of Bob's remarkable and most impressive career achievements. He graduated with distinction from Cornell University in 1970 with a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering and then earned his doctorate degree from MIT in 1974. After honing his research skills down the road at Harvard Medical School's Children's Hospital, Bob was appointed to faculty back at his doctoral alma mater, that is MIT, in 1977. Since then, he has risen through the ranks to his current status as one of only 11 David H. Koch Institute professors, the highest honor that can be awarded to an MIT faculty member. At MIT, Bob runs one of the largest academic labs in America and indeed in the world, overseeing some 100 faculty, staff, and postdoctoral scholars whose work happens at the intersection between biotechnology and material science. A major focus of the famous Langer Lab is the study and development of polymers to deliver drugs, particularly genetically engineered proteins, DNA, RNA, and likes of those, continuously at control rates for prolonged periods of time. During the course of his career, Bob has accumulated a 70 pages long CV, small font, single spaced, <laughs> that includes the following small sampling of achievements. He has written more than 1,250 articles. His inventions hold nearly 1,050 patents, many of which have been licensed or sub-licensed to more than 250 pharmaceutical, chemical, biotechnology, and medical device companies around the world. And his work has been recognized by more than 220 major awards. You can just see the daunting task that I have if I were to recite them, we'll be here for a long time. Just, just a few sampling of those major awards. In 1996, Canada-based Gardner Foundation honored Bob with its prestigious international award, making Bob the only engineer to have ever received this prestigious honor, which is largely reserved for pure medical researchers. What an accomplishment in itself. In 1998, the Lamelson MIT Prize, the world's largest award for invention, which celebrated Bob as one of history's most prolific inventors in medicine. And the 2002 Charles Turk Draper Prize, which is considered by many, suddenly in the engineering community, the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in engineering. More recently, in 2012, Bob was elected as a charter fellow to the National Academy of Inventors, and earlier this year he received the $3 million Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences. So these are the scientific side of his recognition. Popular media are also impressed with Bob's many achievements. Time Magazine and CNN named him among the 100 most important people in America, 
and one of the top 18 people in science and medicine. Forbes magazine named him among the 15 innovators worldwide who will reinvent our future. And Parade magazine has counted Bob among the six heroes whose research may save your life. A very powerful statement. Mr. Chancellor, I think the sampling of many of Bob's accomplishments speak for themselves. Today, Western is very proud to count itself among the 22 globally recognized research intensive universities that have chosen to honor this extraordinary man's dedication to medical discovery. I wish that we are ahead of the pack, but I can tell you with great pride that we are the first Canadian university to recognize Bob for his many accomplishments. As president and vice chancellor, and in the name of the Senate, it gives me great pleasure to ask you, Mr. Chancellor, to confer the degree of Doctor of Science honoris causa upon Robert Samuel Langer. By virtue of the authority vested in me as Chancellor, I admit you to the degree of Doctor of Science honoris causa. Congratulations, Dr. Langer. On behalf of all assembled here today, I should now like to invite our newest alumnus, Dr. Robert Langer, to address convocation. Doctor. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here with you today and wish to congratulate all of you. In speaking with you this morning, I'd like to just leave you with three simple messages. First. As you graduate and you choose a job, choose something that you really love, not just something that makes money or something your parents tell you to do, but choose something that you really feel a passion for. Second, try to dream big dreams, dreams that can change the world and make it a better place. And third, you know, sometimes as you try to pursue those dreams, things won't always work out the way you want to, and things sometimes may look bad, but don't give up on those dreams. I thought, actually, I'd just use myself as an example. You've heard some of the good things I've done. I love, it's not always been that way. So uh, I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about my own background. When I went to college, um, I really didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. In fact, in high school, the only things I was good at were math and science. And so my guidance counselor and my dad said, well, I should become an engineer. And, and I really didn't understand that, because at that time, I thought that engineers ran railroad cars. And I could never see why math and science would help you with that. But anyhow, I did decide to uh, try engineering. And actually, my first year, I, I did uh, pretty well in chemistry. I did awful in everything else. But um, so I decided to major in chemical engineering. But when I finished uh, my undergraduate work, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So I, I went to graduate school. And then I went to MIT. And when I finished graduate school, I still didn't know what I wanted to do. That was a while back. It was the mid-1970s. And what happened was that at that time, just like a couple years ago, there was a gas shortage. And, and that meant the prices kept going up. And actually, even in Boston, you had to wait in line for hours to get your car tank filled up. But what that meant was if you were a chemical engineer, you got a lot of job offers. And, and so all my classmates pretty much went to oil companies. And uh, so I thought that's what I should do, too. They had enormous openings, they had very high paying jobs, um, and, and, and everybody was doing that. So I thought I should do that too. I actually got 20 job offers from oil companies, four from Exxon alone. But, but I remember going to one of these interviews at Exxon, 
in Baton Rouge, and, and they were telling me, you know, if you could just increase the yield of this one petrochemical by 0.01%, they said that would be wonderful. They said that would be worth billions of dollars. You know, but I remember flying home that night thinking to myself that, that I really didn't want to do that. I just didn't, I wanted to think of some way that I could use my education to make an impact. I had this dream, I didn't know what I wanted to do with it exactly, but my dream was could I use my education to somehow improve people's lives? When I was a graduate student, one of the things I did is I spent a lot of time starting a school for poor kids uh, to try to get them, ex almost all who were high school dropouts, to try to get them excited about math and science. And I developed new kinds of chemistry curricula. And one day I saw an ad uh, at City College of New York um, to be an assistant professor to do that, to develop new kinds of interesting chemistry curricula. So I, I applied for a job, I wrote them a letter, but they uh, didn't write me back. But, but I liked the idea, so I found all the ads I could to do that, about 40 different ads, and I wrote to all these colleges. Um, actually, none of them wrote me back. <laughs> so that wasn't going real well. So I started to think, well, what other ways could I use my education to help people, and I thought about medicine. So I wrote to a lot of hospitals and medical schools. They uh, didn't write me back either. And then one day, one of the people in the lab where I was working as a graduate student said to me, he said, Bob, he said, there's this surgeon in Boston named Dr. Judah Folkman. And he said, sometimes he hires unusual people. <laughs> and so what I did is I, 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 uh, I, I, I took a, what a lot of my friends told me was a huge risk, and I began working at, the hosp at a hospital. That's where Dr. Folkman worked. And in fact, I was the only engineer in the entire hospital. Uh, at that time, this was the 1970s, nobody did stuff like that, now, now they do. And by the way, it was a much lower paying job than any of the oil companies. The projects that I began working on involved developing plastics that could slowly release molecules to someday treat cancer. And many of these molecules were, were big molecules and no one had ever been able to develop a way to deliver them for more than a few seconds. And in fact, the scientific literature said that it was impossible to do. I often say the only thing I had going for me is I hadn't read that literature. <laughs> so I spent two years working on this, and I actually found over 200 different ways to get this to not work. <laughs> but finally, I made a discovery about how to modify plastics so that we could release these molecules for, for a long time, and, um, and that actually would lead to a whole new field and actually new ways of treating cancer. I should point out that up to that point, my career was pretty straightforward uh, in terms of, you know, doing research. But I also remember after I started doing some of uh, this work, I got asked to give this talk uh, at, a, at a big me scientific meeting in Michigan. And it was, had a lot of very famous scientists at it, and I was a really young guy. And I'd never really given a big talk before, I except uh, for one in eighth grade which was only a minute and a half speech. And what I did in that time is I remember uh, writing out this speech and for about three hours I practiced it in front of my parents' mirror the night before. And then, you know, I did it over and over again. And then the day came and I gave the talk in front of my eighth grade class. And actually the, for, for the first minute and two seconds I, I did okay. I, I, but then I couldn't remember the next word. And I stood up there frozen for the next, um, you know, for the next minute saying absolutely nothing until my eighth grade teacher uh, told me to sit down um, and, and gave me a not very good grade. I think it was an F. So now when this M Michigan talk came many years later, I, I was very nervous. I stopped working about two weeks in advance of the talk and I kept practicing it over and over into a tape recorder. And finally I got up and I gave that talk, uh, you, know, uh, you know, it's 38 years ago now. And I thought at the end of it, I did all right. I didn't forget too much what I was gonna say. I didn't stammer too much. So I thought, um, that, uh, that when I was done, all these older chemists and engineers, you know, being nice people, that they would want to encourage me, this young guy. But I w when I was done, a number of the scientists came up to me and they said, we don't believe anything you just said. <laughs> they said, you know, just like the literature said, we know you can't get these molecules through plastics, like it's like any of you walking through a wall. Um, and uh, so it's, it's just impossible. Also, shortly after that talk, I, I tried to get funding from the government uh, to support my research, and I uh, wrote a large number of grants. That's what you do when you're a professor. I remember my first nine were turned down. 
And in addition, the year after, I finally got a faculty job, and, but what happened was the year after, a year after I got it, the chairman who hired me, the department head, he left. Uh, he left he, and he wasn't chairman anymore, so a number of the senior faculty at MIT decided to give me some advice. And basically their advice was that I ought to start looking for another job. So there I was, I was getting my grants turned down, people not believing in my research and having little hope of even keeping uh, my job. And that was actually the lowest you know, job, lowest assistant professor you could have. But what happened was, is within a year or two, various people began reproducing what we did. Um, the molecules that could stop blood vessels would end up becoming new drugs. Now, they've been used to treat over 20 million patients, and these plastics are used by millions of people all over the world. So eventually, MIT was nice enough to let me stay, and I, I did get promoted, as you heard, and many, many people are using these things. I think there's something like over 100 different products that have come out from our work that are helping improve and save lives. So I guess my point was, just using myself, but I think it's true for everybody, that when you graduate from college, the path you follow is often confusing, it's often unclear, and it's sometimes scary. It certainly was for me. But I hope you will choose something that you really love and that you will dream big dreams about how you can do things to help people and improve the world. And there may be times when you try to do something in whatever field you're, you're in or you try to invent something and people will tell you that it's impossible, that it'll never work. But I think that's very rarely true. I think if you really believe in yourself, if you really stick to things and work hard, there's very little that's truly impossible. I wish you all the very best in your future, and I want to congratulate you and all your families uh, on this graduation. Thank you so much for having me here.